Welcome back, Windy City Travelers and Explorers. I'm Andy, tour guide with Free Tours by Foot, and today we're downtown in the South Loop on Dearborn Street, touring the earliest examples of the skyscraper, which was invented right here in Chicago in the late 1800s. So while today we may think of our skyscrapers as 50, 60, 90 stories or more, the original skyscrapers, the ones we're visiting today, are the five oldest remaining ones that we still have, and they are example of the tall building in its infancy. So we'll discuss what made these buildings new and different, what defined them as the first, and the people, of course, behind their design. Our route today takes us northbound on Dearborn Street, first at the Manhattan Building, then the nearby Colony and Fisher Buildings. We'll visit the gargantuan Madnadnock Building, take a walk through the Federal Center, and then we're going to finish up at the awe-inspiring Marquette, one of my favorites from this time period, for its interior lobby alone, which we will also explore. So make yourself a nice warm beverage and settle in as we go back in time for the birth of the skyscraper. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are beginning the tour standing on the corner of Ida B. Wells and Dearborn Street. We are looking currently at the Manhattan Building, built by William LeBaron Jenny in 1891. Jenny is widely noted as the father of the skyscraper for his home insurance building, which was completed just a few blocks north from here back in 1885 and was sadly demolished in 1931 to make room for new skyscrapers without any consideration of its historical value, apparently. But we will walk by the original site of that building later on. Um, but what makes that the first or what makes these skyscrapers to begin with? Um, basically, the home insurance building was the first building made completely out of a metal frame, and it was 10 stories tall. Those are the two things that make a skyscraper a skyscraper. Uh, prior to the home insurance building or the Manhattan building that we're looking at, buildings were built with masonry, right? Brick and mortar, uh, stone over stone with large load-bearing walls. So that's the difference there. Now, while we can't see the home insurance building, the Manhattan building is the next best thing. And it shows off what Jenny was doing at the time. He was experimenting with a lot of different styles. You see, uh, he broke up the facade in a number of ways. And actually what he was doing here was trying to de-escalate the height of the building. Because at the time that he was building the skyscraper, citizens and officials were actually very nervous about these big tall buildings and their potential to fall over and hurt people. So there was actually an ordinance placed in Chicago in the 1890s to limit the height of a skyscraper to only 10 stories. So just as we were getting started building them, we were limited by, by fear. Now, my favorite feature of this building are actually the ghoulish faces looking back at you. So Jenny, at the time of building skyscrapers, knew that people suddenly were going to be looking up. So he wanted to make sure something was looking back at you. And if you take our Haunted History and Ghost Tour, uh, this is always a really fun spot to ask people to look up at those faces. All right, we are going to keep walking to our next spot, which is the Colony Building, uh, built by two of my favorite architects, uh, William Holabird and Martin Roche. Uh, this would be in 1894, so three years after the Manhattan Building. And the Colony Building gives us a great example of the Chicago School of Architecture, which is not a university or a school at all. It's a, a design form. Uh, and the Chicago School of Architecture, I'll, I'll walk you through it now while we're looking at the colony, which was, there's three parts. Uh, so first you have your base, uh, pretty, pretty easy to identify there. You've got your base structure, then you have your shaft or the height of the building, all the office floors in between the base and the top. And all of those office floors are designed to accentuate the height of the building. So you want long, tall windows, long, clean lines, and, and nothing breaking that up. So you accentuate your height, and then you top it off, uh, top the eye off with an ornate top. So here you see this beautiful cornice jutting out from the top of the building. That makes up the uh, final part of the school of architecture that is known as Chicago. Now today, the colony building is actually student housing, housing Columbia students. Um, but you can see a really unique feature about this building is that it was built 
uh, right next to our elevated train station. So there's just a few inches between the dorm windows and the incoming trains. And these trains do run all night and day. So I wonder how the students feel about that. <laughs> And we're going to keep on walking to, I think, what will be some of your favorite building. You'll have to let me know in the comments below what which of these buildings we see actually ends up being your favorite. Uh, next up is the Fisher Building, which has a lovely little joke in the architecture. I love when architects have a funny bone. So we're going to take that one in next. So it's this orange building that you're seeing right here. So the Fisher Building was built in 1896 by Charles Atwood for the Daniel Burnham and Company uh, architects. Daniel Burnham, the firm, uh, that individual was perhaps the most influential man in all of Chicago history, if you ask me. Uh, he had a heavy hand in the design of our World's Fair of 1893, our redesign as an entire city after the Great Chicago Fire, and with his Burnham plan also gave us a long-lasting uh, infrastructure within our entire city. So Charles Atwood worked for Burnham and was commissioned to create the Fisher Building. We're just waiting for the light to turn before I get up close and personal. But this, this building is an example of what architects at that time were saying, which was that the skyscraper wasn't just built out of their dreams, but the dreams of businessmen and uh, moguls at the time who wanted these tall buildings in order to make money. Uh, and this is a great example because this was built for Lucius Fisher, who was a printing row magnet. He was a printer. Uh, back after the fire, all of the loop area here, South Loop, was known for printing and publishing. It was making us a lot of money at the time, and Lucius Fisher was one of its kings. So he wanted a nice tall building in his name, in his honor, and Atwood had a little bit of fun with his name, as you can see now that we're closer in the decorating of the ornamentation. Uh, because his name had the word fish in it, you will see that he put on the building a lot of aquatic fish. So this is not only Gothic inspired, but ocean inspired. You're seeing crabs and fish as you get up close and personal. We're going to see a salamander crawl on his way down the building as well. This was 1896. There's even a star in between, which I think is supposed to be a starfish. I'll give you just a glimpse of the entryway too. Uh, I believe on the glass, hopefully that's still around. Yes. So in the glass, hopefully the camera's picking that up, there's also a fish. Very cool, right? Beautiful building designed by Charles Atwood. Now, another example of commerce at the time, big buildings built for moguls to make a lot of money, is its next door neighbor right across the street. This is the Monadnock building. I love the Monadnock building. Oh, there's a train, I can't wait for that to go by actually our underground train that you're hearing. So the Monadnock building, this is a 16 story tall building that was actually designed in two parts. We're going to talk about both of those parts, but when it was completed in 1893, this was the largest office building of commercial space in the world. Okay. Now, two sets of architects built this. First would be Hollow, or I'm sorry, Burnham and Root. Uh, on the north side, that lighter brick without the cornice. You see at the very top, the, the side of the building that does not have the cornice at the top. That is Burnham and Root's half. And that is a load-bearing structure, meaning that is built out of brick and mortar. Love the onesies. Uh, that is our old, before the skyscraper, that's how we built buildings. Now, in order to get that amount of height, they had to build very thick walls. And we're going to walk across the street and see those walls in just a second. But this is your best view from this angle here. So you had to have very thick load-bearing walls to support a height uh, of that size. Whereas later on, uh, so I'm sorry, that would be 1891. In 1893, just a couple years later, uh, the next pair, Holabird and Roche, would build the steel frame half of this structure, with, which was able to have much thinner walls, uh, but accomplished the same amount of height. So we're gonna cross the street. And I'm, sorry for the pause. Just, just trying to be a courteous pedestrian in the wind. Okay, so now that we're across the street, we're still at the Monadnock building. We are looking first on this corner. This again is the south side built by Hollibird and Broche. And you're going to see how thin 
uh, this layer, this facade is on the steel frame. This layer of brick is very thin, okay? Here, keep, see my hand here, this will be relevant in a minute. So as we walk along, I will also give you just an example of the old timey shops, as I mentioned. Now, of course, COVID hit our city a little hard. So you're gonna see some of these are either closed down for the day or closed down permanently for now. A beautiful shot of the archway of the Monadnock. And a tour guest actually was who told me initially way back when I started in 2015 with Free Tours by Foot, uh, we were touring the space and he said, you know, Monadnock means a mountain isolated. It's all alone. So I think the Monadnock, that is a very fitting name for this building. So again, seeing the thin version, we're still on the south side. Floridora here shows an excellent example of old shopping with tailoring, beautiful stitching. You're going to see an example of a cobbler here, dashing Chicago. You got your shoes. I'm sure you can see my camera as well. Hello. <laughs> okay. Now, if you're just walking by, you don't know to look for this. You might not notice that this building is split in two. But if you do know, you can see this is the corner right here where the south ends. Ah, and the north branch ends. Very thicker wall here. You're going to see this is even not as thick, of course, as this goes in a moment. But now we are looking at the Burnham and Root half of this building. You see the shoe repair. This is the shoe hospital here. And the jewelry store. Field and florist, doesn't that just the the lettering in itself so so cool? All right, now here's another glimpse the inset of this building, how thick uh, it is. Here, I'll put my put my hand back for reference. Uh, very thick walls. You can see why this would not be ideal. Very expensive. Custom clothiers. You see the old timey sewing machine. I used to work at a theater costume shop. They would love this building. And then my favorite shop right here is Optimo. And you'll see why. It makes fedoras. Beautiful. Of course, Chicago. This conjures up our 1920s gangster time. Hope you can see those. It's a bit hard with the reflection of the street. I have no idea what those guys are up to. No clue. Oh, here. Optimo hat makers. Beautiful. Now, we have one more building, only one today, uh, of the ancient skyscrapers to see. But before we get there, we do have to pass through the Federal Center, which is made up of these three, well, two that you're seeing and one more, Mies van der Rohe modern buildings. You're seeing a great example of mid-modernism in architecture by the great Mies van der Rohe who believed, of course, that less is more. If you guys know that phrase, that was the architect of Mies. I don't know when that became popular vernacular for all of us, uh, but Mies did coin that. He believed God was in the details. He said, no ornamentation, uh, no cornices, no gargoyles, all the stuff that makes buildings fun, right? He said, instead, you just need these clean lines, uh, well-made materials, and that is beautiful architecture. This would become known as the international style of architecture, which needs to be its own video, if I'm honest, <laughs> but does give you a stark contrast of where we came from in the 1890s versus where we ended up. This would have been around 1959, 1960s, uh, that the federal center was done. And this is yet another Mies van der Rohe post office right next to the Alexander Calder Flamingo. That is the Flamingo. If you don't see it, I cannot help you. <laughs> so, and Federal Plaza or Federal Center, this, this plaza is just wonderful. It just gives you such a taste of architecture from literally every time period in Chicago, dating from the oldest, our grand finale in front of us, the Marquette Building, uh, through the 1920s up through the 70s as well. 
Now there's actually about to be a protest, I was told. Uh, so actually, we, we just passed a bunch of police officers back there. So we're gonna try and finish up filming, but not before we visit the Marquette. The Marquette building is my personal favorite. It is built by, again, my favorite architects of Hollibird and Roche. Uh, this would be, This would be in respect to one of the founders of the Chicago River, Father Jacques Marquette is the namesake. And this was actually redesigned, or not redesigned, but re, um, was fixed up in 2001 uh, with the cornice was replaced on top. It had initially been removed in the 1950s and the MacArthur Foundation, when they purchased the building, redid the cornice and made it out of fiberglass. So we can still see a great example of the original building. This is also a great location to talk about the Chicago style window. You guys may know about the Chicago style hot dog. You may not know that we also have a window that is Chicago style. Because we were the first people to build skyscrapers at this height, we are also the same people to run into the problem that we needed a lot of sunlight in our tall, tall buildings. So we needed big panes of glass but we also need to be able to open our windows to allow for temperature control and air quality control as well. So we can't open a big window uh, when we're very high up. We might cause sway or cause our building to fall over. So instead we came up with the Chicago style. Single large pane of glass in the center that does not open, flanked on either side by two smaller windows that do open and close, or at least would have back in the heyday. Also interesting to note, that the original skyscraper, the OG uh, home insurance building built by Jenny would have been on the corner right here of Adams and LaSalle where that red brick building is just down the way. Of course, unfortunately, is demolished. Now, before we go into the Marquette, we're just gonna take in Federal Center one more time. And just past that, that is the entrance to the birth of the skyscraper, our historic skyscraper district on South Dearborn. Now I mentioned that this building was the namesake after Father Jacques Marquette. We're gonna see his name on the building and we're gonna tell you his story as well. Again, like the Monadnock, you see that nice kind of 1920s lettering on this building too. So, depiction here is of Father Marquette, along with a guy named Louis Joliet, both on a mission from France uh, to explore the Mississippi River. There was this waterway right in the center of the United States at the time that was being explored by the Spanish, and the French wanted to also have a good idea about the capabilities of that waterway. So uh, Louis Joliet and Father Jacques Marquette uh, went south and then on their way back north to report their findings uh, they met some Native Americans who graciously offered to show them a shortcut to Lake Michigan if they would portage their canoe in the swampy prairie which you see I think this is a great depiction of that grass and that swamp that they had uh, you could see that there was a shortcut uh, going north and so the Chicago River uh, is what that would later become. But at the time, it was just a small, small portage first seen by Father Marquette. Now, I, of course, do want to take you inside. I just have to pause very quickly. I want to make sure everyone inside is okay with me filming today. So I will see you in a moment. Wonderful. So they are so generous here. They let me film. So we are inside the Marquette building. This is the lobby of this space. Can you imagine? Uh, this is a nine to five office owned by the MacArthur Foundation. Uh, and this is, you know, a place you could just be coming to work every day in Chicago. Nothing special to see here, right? Uh, this beautiful Tiffany mosaic uh, was here, as far as I can tell, right after the World's Fair, when this building was built. This would have been installed shortly after. I wasn't able to find the exact date. But again, it's telling the same story of Louis Juliet, who you're seeing there, and Father Marquette doing their missionary work with the Native Americans. And it actually goes as far as to depict Father Marquette's death along that Chicago River, which you're seeing right there. Now this lobby and mosaic also shows off 
some of the key players in early, early Chicago or pre-Chicago history for this area that they, of course, called Chicagoe, there's Joliet, uh, and we would later turn into the name Chicago. Here's Marquette. There's a chief with a name that also looks very familiar. And then another favorite feature, we're not even done in this lobby, is that if you come through when you visit the Marquette into a miniature free architecture museum. Uh, I love to bring folks in here on private tours when I have a small group and, and this is where I teach my lesson about Chicago which is the phrase go in anyway. If you've taken one of my tours you know I always say go inside anyway. The building looks fancy. Go in. Uh, you'll never know what you find and here you will find of course a, a little museum describing the birth of the early skyscrapers which some of which we've already talked about today. All right, so that about wraps up our tour. I did realize as soon as I walked out of the Marquette building that I think I forgot to tell you two very key fun facts I wanted to share today. So we're gonna wrap up with those. Uh, one, I always get asked on my tours from guests what, about the elevator. Uh, when was the elevator invented in these big, tall skyscraper buildings? Uh, fun fact, the elevator predates the skyscraper. Otis, Elijah Otis, unveiled the passenger safe elevator in 1854 in New York City. Uh, and while it is no means the passenger elevator we know today, it was passenger safe because it had a safety mechanism that would catch the cart uh, should a cable snap. So nothing would go plummeting down. So that's number one. And I'm also pretty sure I forgot to tell you while we were looking at the Monadnock building that that was also the first building ever wired for electricity. Pretty important fact that I like to share when I talk about that one. So those are your last facts. That concludes our tour. Thank you so much for joining me. If you had a wonderful time and learned something new, please consider tipping your guide. There's a link in the description to buy me a coffee. Uh, please subscribe to this channel if you aren't already and hit that thumbs up and that notification. All of those things help us so, so much. I would also love to hear from you and know who's watching. So if you can leave me a comment below about what your favorite building today was or where you're watching from, uh, I would love to see that. Free tours by foot we offer for walking tours all across the city of Chicago, across the country, and across the world. So be sure to check that out. And you can check out other videos on this channel. I walk you around exploring and giving you a lot of traveler tips for your own visit. Thank you so much for joining, and I will see you next time.